Hi students and welcome to this lecture specifically on photography. Um, I'll start today uh, with a few uh, learning objectives as usual. We'll start by describing the origins of photography and looking at some of its formal principles. And then we'll talk about how, you know, obviously uh, originally photography was only in black and white. So then we'll talk about how color and digital technologies have uh, transformed the process itself. Um, and then we'll outline the basic principles of film editing. So we'll talk a little bit about what artists can do in a dark room, um, um, how they can ma manipulate uh, an image. But I always like to start by talking about the process of photography itself, um, because it's pretty amazing and it's really hard for us to even really comprehend how exciting and um, just revolutionary the invention of photography would have been um, in the late 1800s. So today we take it for granted, right? We all have our, our phones. Um, if you have any type of phone uh, with probably even the flip phone, um, you probably have a somewhat good camera on your phone, especially if you have like a new iPhone. Those cameras are really high technology, really uh, produce wonderful images. And we really do take it for granted. We could just have it in our pocket at all times, take a picture or whatever, delete the picture, edit the picture. We'll talk more about Instagram later. Um, but of course, this was not always uh, an option for people. Um, obviously, in the 1800s, uh, photography didn't exist. It's a relatively new medium in terms of the scope of this class and of the variety of mediums that we're looking at. And, um, you know, before photography existed, there was basically no way for you to know what uh, we, what your grandparents, great grandparents, you know, what your ancestors looked like, except if you had paintings of them. And let's remember, paintings were not cheap, right? Um, you know, and not everyone was trained, uh, was allowed to be trained to be a painter. And so only basically rich people uh, were allowed to be painters. Uh, of course, no women or people of color, unfortunately, um, until later. And so it was probably if you had a rich, came from a rich family, you might have portraits of your ancestors, um, but probably not. And guess what? Um, a painting of your great uncle is actually not going to be as realistic as a, a portrait, uh, a, I'm sorry, a, a photographic portrait. So the really cool thing about photography is that for the very first time in history, basically uh, you could have the exact imprint of reality Onto, uh, onto a piece of paper. So this is really, really exciting. The process include, involves, uh, basically, if you opened up a camera, the camera captures light, which bounces off of an object. So if you're taking a picture of me, the camera would be capturing all the light bouncing off of me, and then reflecting the contours of me. The light is then reflected into a light-sensitive paper within a camera box, and we'll look at one in just a second. So there is a direct relationship for the very first time between what is seen and what is then printed. Um, so photography and reality are becoming uh, much more uh, close to one than, for instance, if you had someone making a sculpture of you or a painting of you. There's no direct relationship between the two unless you have a photograph. So this would have been so exciting. Um, and it's, it's almost like hard for me to talk about it with such an excitement because I know it's lost on so many of us, but I hope I can kind of convey just how crazy this would have been at the turn of uh, the 20th century. So here's kind of what I was talking about before. Um, this is early, the early history of the camera. There would be a darkened room called a camera obscura. And look how big this is, right? This cannot be put in anyone's pocket, right? This is a stationary object. Um, so this is called the camera obscura. It was used by artists to record uh, nature accurately in the 16th century. So that's way before the 1900s, where we really have the development of photography. But this is a precursor to photography. Basically, artists would use this to, it uses the same process of photography. It reflects light into a box, and then artists would actually trace something uh, using the reflected image. So it's closer to reality, but it's still not the actual imprint. So as you see the small hole showing a ray of light that projects a scene upside down on the opposite wall. Um, and it could capture the image, but of course it cannot preserve it like, uh, the like a photogra uh, photograph could. 
And so it's not until a little later in the early 1800s that we have William Henry Fox Tabbitt, um, who starts experimenting with early photography. Um, it's important to note that there's a little bit of a debate in the history of early photography between William Henry Fox Tabbitt and Louis Daguerre. We'll talk about Daguerre in just a second. Um, Tabbitt is a, a British man um, working in the 18 or, uh, 1830s. He's a Renaissance man in, in some ways. He studies astronomy, science, art, physics. Um, and he starts doing experiments on his own, kind of as a hobby, using light sensitive paper that he coats with chemicals. And he places these out in uh, the sun with different plants on them. And so the plant is covering up part of the paper, so it's not getting exposed to the sun, and then the other parts are getting exposed to the sun. He called these sun drawings. But this is the first time we have the use of a light sensitive paper and chemicals to produce a photogenic drawing. So he called these drawings. Um, so this was basically the first photographic process capable of producing a negative imprint of reality. For instance, here of a fern uh, bush, but he did a lot of different um, types of uh, imprints like this or sun drawings based on uh, plant native plants that he had outside. So basically he starts doing this, um, not thinking that much of it, not thinking it's that important, really thinking it's kind of cool and um, you know giving these as gifts to some of his friends, no big deal. Well meanwhile in France there's another fellow, Louis Daguerre, who is doing the same kind of thing, but taking it pretty seriously and understanding uh, how important his invention is. So um, he's doing a similar thing uh, using a process that yields a positive image, uh, but he's using a polished metal plate that has come to be called a daguerreotype, named uh, after his last name, Daguerre. Um, it was so realistic that it was declared at this time in the early uh, mid 1800s, painting is dead. Who needs painting anymore, right? All of a sudden, it's we have a photograph, which is way better than a painting. Of course, you know, at the time you could see how that would make sense. And now, when you're looking at these old photographs, you're like, is that better than a painting? But you must understand that this would have been absolutely insane to have actually captured reality imprinted onto a metal plate. So Daguerre has become kind of the poster boy for um, inventing photography. He's the one who was kind of smart enough to go and copyright it. And so now we have early photography as daguerreotypes. So that's a key term that you'll see probably in the text this week as well. So the popularity of daguerreotypes um, made portraits available to more than just the upper classes. So prior to this, as I said, you know, paintings, if you wanted the imprint or if you wanted the um, uh, the likeness of someone in your family, um, it would be really expensive, right? Um, so with daguerreotypes, um, you, uh, the lower classes could easily, um, and even if you didn't have that much money, you could go to a place to have a daguerreotype produced for you. The uh, disadvantages of early daguerreotypes include preparation, time, and utmost care, uh, and they cannot be reproduced. So you make one and that's it, right? Um, you might recognize Edgar Allan Poe here on this side. Um, all, you know, if you were anybody, you probably had a daguerreotype done of yourself. So how are da daguerreotypes actually produced? Uh, well, we've looked at the camera already, and of course it's getting a lot smaller by now. It is handheld by this point. But again, you still have um, the reflection in the box that is an imprint of, um, of you know, people in most cases at this point. Um, here's a cool advertisement for a daguerreotype rooms in Boston. I love it. It says the most desirable location for in the business in the city, only one, one flight of stairs. Um, but you know, you can, you can try to read it a little bit here. Um, it says pictures taken in any weather. Um, so something to note, there's a big window that's open here, right? And so it's important to note at this time, it probably still wouldn't have, you know, you'd just be using candlelight or probably natural light. Because um, you really needed a bright light to take the daguerreotype, uh, because otherwise you you wouldn't have the light reflecting off of you as the subject. Um, the other thing about daguerreotypes is you, you would have to sit still uh, without moving for at least half a minute, depending on how good uh, the photographer was or their equipment was. Sometimes and oftentimes up to one minute. It doesn't seem very long, uh, but if I were 
get with you in class, I would make you stop and smile for a minute and try not to move because it does, you know, it, it does get long. For that reason, they had these kind of cool chairs that would help you to kind of straighten up a little bit. Um, the top little blue uh, red things at the top here are to hold your neck in place. So that is why a lot of people end up looking uh, very stiff in their photography in their early photographs, right? If you've seen any of these early uh, photographs before, you'll probably notice uh, those people look mad, right? It's the idea that all these people in these old pictures, they always look so mad. And then there's the other thing like, oh, the blur, right? And the ghost, the ghostly image in the background. Well, that's because if anything were to happen at the time and the minute uh, that uh, the, the sitter was sitting, um, that would be a blur. And so for instance, of course, a dog didn't go well. As you can see here, the dog obviously is not gonna stay still. It looks like it's sticking out its tongue. The baby obviously couldn't stay, uh, stay still, so it's blurred as well. Anytime you see a blur in the background and people think it's like, oh, ghosts of the 1800s. No, it's actually probably someone who came in accidentally during the minute and got accidentally recorded for a moment, so they look like a blur. But you can see the kind of intense posture of some of these people who were probably using a chair like this, like this fellow, for instance. Um, another thing you see often in daguerreotypes is resting one's hand on something. That's because, you you know, if you, if you want to have a picture like this, you have to keep your hand up for a minute. Um, so oftentimes people would rest their hands on things. So um, this is really important. Um, it makes it so that um, uh, artists are able to start capturing everyday life and American visual reality. So you start to see things like this. Here's Walker Evans. Uh, he actually worked for the United States government. Um, and, and likely in a different lecture, we'll talk um, about the uh, um, those specific photographers, um, but they were basically paid to go out during the Great Depression and document uh, poverty and just kind of how people were living um, at this time in history, uh, because for the first time this could actually be done. Um, people, uh, artists were still interested in formal elements. They're not throwing all these away because they now have reality. Um, formal elements are still of interest. For instance, you can see, you know, there's a use of strong diagonals here in Stieglitz's work. There's a division of space. So you have the top half of the boat and the bottom. Of course, we know that this also has to do with class. The rich people got to be at the top and the poor people got to be at the bottom in the steerage for uh, ships like this. Um, so they're interested in spatial relations, form, content. The instantaneous nature of photographs is absolutely exciting to photographers. Here's an early photographer, Henry Cartier-Bresson. Um, so look, he, he, there's an interest in capturing an instant. This is something that only photography can do. For instance, the, uh, the artist was waiting for these two women to go right underneath these two sculptures of women. Uh, women. These are called karyatids, uh, an ancient Greek um, archetype. Um, and then, of course, you see the visual connection between the two women here and the two women there. And one second later, the women have, of course, walked on. So a real interest in what this uh, new medium can do. I always want to bring in surrealism when I talk about photographer photography, because oftentimes it's kind of thrown aside as if, um, you know, surrealists who I will talk about in a later lecture when we get to the art history aspects, um, surrealists are people who are not interested in reality. Right there, it's surreal, it's surreality, it's the things of dreams, the things that are in our minds, right, that aren't real. So there's this idea that surrealists couldn't possibly have been interested in photography, which of course is tied to the to reality and to real, uh, to the real. However, uh, we do have some photographers working in the 1900s who are using photography, but also using manipulation methods in the darkroom to make a, a medium tied to real and reality surreal. Um, so here you have Man Ray, his work, the Minotaur. Of course, it's actually, if you blow, if you uh, squint your eyes, you can see, well, it, it, it looks kind of like a Minotaur, right? It looks like the um, kind of a bull's head, but actually it's a, a female torso. Um, and so, you, you know, obviously darkening the head so it's gone, um, heightening the contrast in the shaded areas to make it look like a bull's head. Um, they also used a montage negative prints like you see here uh, with uh, Marquisa uh, Cassati um, in the 1922 print. Um, so using, you know, double printing, you know, taking the image uh, twice and then printing it. Um, so this is something that would have been done really often as well and would have worked very well in these situations. 
So surrealists were also interested in photography. All right, so the next thing that I wanted to share uh, with you is a, a, a move towards the moving image. Um, so in 1838, there becomes an interest in compiling still images to see, uh, you know, if, if they will create a moving image. And this early experiment was done by Edward Moybridge. Um, basically, he, uh, there was a bet uh, that, um, that uh, people were wondering um, whether or not all of a horse's feet lift off the ground when they're in a gallop. And of course, this is too fast for the naked eye. So people actually didn't know at this time. Um, and so uh, there was this experiment put on by Moybridge to uh, basically let a horse gallop um, and then have a series of cameras um, that would be tripped by a wire as the horse uh, ran and would take pictures like this um, as the horse ran. And then of course, and I do have a footbook of this that I would bring to class if we were together. Um, but of course, as we can see here, indeed, all of the feet of the horse leave the ground at the same time during the gallop. So super cool, but also uh, led to an interest in the moving image. So we're not going to talk about early film. That will be for a different time. Um, but this does lead to early film. Uh, Thomas Edison, who many of you know of, um, and Laurie Dixon, invented the first kinetoscope. Um, this was basically the first celluloid film to produce images that could, of course, move. Um, of course, it's important to note that they couldn't talk, um, so there was no talking quite yet, um, only silent films. But this was pretty important um, to the early development of film using these early experiments um, by Moybridge. Now I want to talk a little bit about the manipulation of photographs in the darkroom. So um, there are um, some things that artists can do in the darkroom. And if you've never taken um, a photography course at, at a college, um, this will all be very new to you. And I must say, um, when I was an undergrad, I was able to take a black and white photography class. And so I got to go in the darkroom, bring in my you know, negatives, print them out, do the whole process, it was so cool. But much of that is so lost on us because I don't, you know, a lot of those classes aren't even um, offered anymore. Dark rooms aren't even really made uh, or um, usually colleges don't have them anymore. They've repurposed them. Um, but it is a really, really cool art form um, to do it manually like that. Because now we have our digital photographs and that, that works really well too. Um, but Fred Archer developed the zoning system for dark rooms, and this is a way for artists to manipulate photos in the dark room. So you go out and take a photograph, um, and then you have what he called the zoning system. So a zone represents the relation of the image's brightness to the value the photographer wishes it to appear, to appear in the final project. Um, here's a, a piece by Ansel Adams that helps us to think about this. Um, this is from the 1940s. Many of you probably heard of Ansel Adams. This is Moonrise Fernandez, New Mexico. So there's dodging and burning. Basically, the way for me to help you think about this is for you to have a piece of paper and put a hole in the middle of it. And so what you would do when you were done producing your image, you'd go into the dark room, you'd expose it to light, you'd expose your, um, you'd basically have a photographic, uh, uh, photography paper, and then you'd put your, um, uh, negative in and then there's a light that you turn on and off and it's timed because it depends how much time you expose uh, the paper to light and of course that's why it's a dark room because you don't want any light in there except for specifically at certain times so you expose um, the paper to the light and then you get dark areas and light areas producing an image well what if you want just the corners to be darker, right? Or just the middle to be darker. Well, you can make something like this and then use the dodging and burning process. So to dodge something decreases exposure of the area, which makes it lighter. And to burn something increases exposure of the area to make it darker. So if I wanted to make the edges darker, if you look at this picture uh, by Ansel Adams, um, you see that he, he made the sky much darker than it was probably, right? And he probably lit up the moon and the sunset. And so what he probably did was he 
I had a tool like this and burned the top to expose more light to it, which would have made it darker, right? So this is really a cool way to work in the with photographs, which do represent reality, but then to manipulate that reality a little bit too. And I always like to bring up uh, Instagram because many of you probably have used it. Um, and this reminds me of like the vignette um, uh, part of that app where you can make the edges darker, right? So this originally was a technique used in the darkroom. Now, I don't want this actually, um, this lecture to get too long, so I'm going to go kind of through this a little quickly. Uh, one more artist I want to look at, Jerry uh, Ewellsman. He's working contemporarily, and he, of course, thought it was really interesting to go into the dark room and manipulate in there. So photography was about what happened after the image was taken, not during the taking of the image. So this, uh, what you see here on the screen is like a contact sheet. This shows you all the images you've taken with the camera, and then you can go and decide what you want to uh, print out and manipulate. So he ends up doing a, a, taking a, a number of these images out and then using the, um, the darkroom to manipulate them and make them into these very surrealist images. So here you have an image of hands that he's basically, he's basically dodged out everything around the hands, so you only see the hands. Here he's dodged out only the, the whole top and the middle one, so it's completely white. And he's dodged out the whole bottom and this tree one. And then he's placed them on top of one another and made this super surrealist odd image. And all of this work was done in the dark room. And then he's placed it in a variety of different settings. So um, just an idea of what can be done in the dark room. Um, now let's talk a little about, uh, about digital photography and colored photography. Color was not associated with photography really uh, in, as an art form um, um, until uh, later on. It was basically associated early on with advertising. Um, it was ignored by fine arts until the 1960s. You can see here with these uh, images that um, color was often um, painted on. You can see if you have pictures of your great-great-grandparents perhaps or something. Um, nice ones. They'll sometimes have, you know, images that are a little painted where they add a little pigment to the cheeks or so forth. Um, so, but it's not until later where we have a real interest in the rise of color photography coinciding with the growing popularity of color television and Polaroid cameras. Um, this is not specifically a Polaroid. It is a Fuji film, uh, but this is my Polaroid camera. It, you know, it prints out a big picture um, that you, of course, flap it. You don't have to flap it though, um, but that's of course from the song. Um, but you know, it turned you, you have the picture right there for you, and it's really cool because it prints instantly. Um, so Polaroid cameras were really inexpensive um, and a really cool way to process uh, photography by yourself straight from the camera. Um, so this, of course, contributed to photography is becoming more popularized in in um, culture as well uh, when the first. Um, uh, Polaroid cameras came out. Today, um, photography has become such a popularized art form because, you know, like I said at the beginning, we all have it at our fingertips. Um, there's Instagram, right? There's other, you know, and you can go on Facebook or whatever. And basically, Facebook is about sharing images of yourself as well, um, just like Instagram. Here's a, a bunch of kind of ways you can manipulate your photographs in Instagram. So I took these three photos. It's not like I'm the most amazing photographer, but Instagram makes me feel like I'm really good because it gives me the tools, like I'm going to a dark room or something and manipulating these photos, right? Um, so it does kind of allow us to have a little fun. Um, and that's all I wanted to go over today. I try to keep it short. I'm sorry, it was a little long. Please let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you next time.